Hi, this is Guy Wallace with another edition of my video series, Adventures in Performance-Based Training and Development, with your host, me, Guy Wallace. Note I've also subtitled this series, The Insomnia Solution. Not for my insomnia, but for yours. Just kidding. When I became a consultant in the training and development space way back in November of 1982, I vowed that I was going to do most of my work, if possible, fixed fee. I had been changed, ordered to death when I was a training project supervisor at Motorola back in 1981 and 82. And as I became a consultant, I decided that I didn't want to do business that way. I, it was uh, led to a lot of customer dissatisfaction, me, my dissatisfaction with the vendors that were serving me at Motorola. So I vowed that, uh, you know, I wasn't going to do it that way. And luckily for me, when I joined Ray Svensson, I was a subcontractor to his consulting firm. I had my own business, the Wallace Works. And uh, Ray was a detailed planner. Now, he's a former Bell Labs engineer, went into eight, uh, Bell Labs management, then into AT&T management, did strategic planning. And uh, as many engineers, maybe all, um, he was into the details. So when we did project plans and proposals, we did the project planning at a fairly detailed level. Now that's important to me because I used the framework that we used, each phase of our projects planned out at a fairly detailed level so that I could more accurately estimate the touch time of people because those were the hours my consultants, me and the other consultants on the staff were gonna spend on a project. And that was used to do uh, cost plus pricing, if you will, based on the number of hours that we believe we were gonna put into the project. So I could do the fixed fee proposals. Uh, there were times when that's problematic and I didn't do that. And I did it uh, time and expense based on estimates of the touch time. Uh, in the in a project plan based on this framework the the framework also allowed me to not only look at the touch time but to decide how much cycle time did I need to leave in order to get that done if the uh, touch time was going to be four days did I just leave it four days of cycle time to get it done or five days or six days or seven days you know what was safe what was really doable uh, my consultants, were like me, worked on many projects kind of simultaneously, not at, at the same moment, but I often had five, six, seven projects with clients going on at the same time. And I'd work on one and then work on the other one, and there was all the lag time. You'd send things off to clients, they'd review it, and you'd have to do something with that downtime on the one project. But so the framework allowed me to do touch time, cycle time, and establish dates which were important when you're gonna do a facilitated group process approach for your analysis and, and design efforts, you would need to you know, schedule a three-day meeting, two-day meeting, four-day meeting, whatever it was gonna be for the analysis and all the people needed to show up, need to put it on their calendars. Um, and the same thing um, with for review meetings with your client group. Um, anyway, so this video is gonna talk about that planning framework my version, if you will, of ADDIE, Analysis, Design, Development, Implementation, and Evaluation. Except my model, MCD, Modular Curriculum Development Slash Acquisition, had six phases. They all, all my efforts start off with the first phase of being project planning and kickoff. And then the second phase is analysis, the third is design, the fourth is development, the fifth is pilot testing, and the sixth is revision and release. Um, so that's my model. Um, I This is a cleaner graphic of it, but there's a couple older graphics that I have from newsletters back at the time when I was with Svensson and Wallace Incorporated uh, back in the 80s uh, and 90s. And so the model the six phases I've been using and what I'm showing you now is a graphic from the fall of 1991 in our newsletter and it talks about the uh, four-day workshop that I'm going to be doing 
and the next uh, iteration, the next newsletter that I have, I didn't capture all of them. We did, we called it a quarterly newsletter, but we didn't release them quarterly. I had suggested at one time, maybe we shouldn't call it a quarterly newsletter if we're not going to actually put one out every quarter. But anyway, in the summer of 92, I covered the six phases and began a series in these newsletters to cover each one of the phases in my six phase model. I call it phases, it could be called stages, you know, lots of different language that we use were, were totally inconsistent. But let me walk through now this, uh, my approach to addy like level of design and development, including analysis, in my POTS diagram. Well, POTS stands for phases, outputs, and teams. Mine is a team approach and has been since actually 1979 when I was at Wix Lumber, then in the 81-82 I was at Motorola's Training and Education Center and I tried to use a group process facilitating groups of master performers, other subject matter experts, sometimes managers, sometimes novice performers to conduct my analysis and my design and even my development. And of course then when you go into pilot testing that's a group process as well. So the first phase generates a primarily a project plan. Now there's lots of activities that lead to you developing a project plan, but then there's a gate review meeting with the project steering team where you're reviewing your draft project plan. And once you come out of that meeting, you either are given the go-ahead to do it just as you planned, make some changes perhaps, and then you've got a final project plan and then you can release it. One of the things that I learned from Ray Svensson was that we always separated the project plan from the proposal. The proposal had the price, the terms and conditions, the, the, the payment schedule, if you will. It was the contractual portion of our efforts with our clients. Um, and it always referred to the project plan. And Ray's separation of the two things was quite genius, I think, and I thought so back then. We could disseminate the project plan that didn't have all that pricing stuff that our clients didn't necessarily want shared with everybody across their organization that might be involved with our project. But we could disseminate the project plan, which um, I'll cover in a subsequent video, but goes into a fairly um, great amount of detail as to, you know, who are the teams, what are the phases, what outputs will we produce, uh, what are our deliverables at the end of the project, etc. Um, so this phase two then is conducting the analysis and there's four types of analysis that I do when I'm doing instructional design projects. There's a target audience uh, data. So who are they? What can we safely assume about them? What can we safely not assume about them? You know, what are the variables? What are their typical backgrounds and education? And, you know, we're trying to decide, uh, do we have to modulize some of our content so people can skip what they already know? unless there's a reason for bringing a mixture of people who know the content and don't know the content or know some of the content and don't know the other content and they can learn from each other you can learn from some of the other peers that you have who've been there and done that and have had some experience and have learned these things and they can contribute as adult learners they like to contribute we all should know that the third phase design takes the oh the, so there's other analysis data so there's the performance data then there's the enabling knowledge and skills data. And finally, there's an assessment of existing training content to see what can be reused as is or after modification, or perhaps it's not applicable. And people might assume that you're gonna reuse some of that content, but you've deemed it not applicable for some reason. And of course, you're gonna to have to justify that because often that crosses into political issues and you know it's best to you know, have good reasons for you know all your decisions in a in a project like that. Um, but those are the four types of analysis data: target audience, performance, knowledge and skills, and what content can we reuse. Um, and then that all feeds the design phase. So in between, there's again another project steering team gate review meeting where you read out that analysis data and you tell the client this is what we're going to go do with it in the next phase unless of course you stop us now or need to redirect us or you have any questions that you want answered or challenges that you have that you want us to address. So we do that, we run that gauntlet in the gate review meeting and then we go into the design phase and we take all that analysis data and we construct a design. And I'll get into some a little bit of the details of that uh, in a moment. Um, once we've done the design, 
then we can f go through another gate review, review that with a client before we start developing, before we ins start investing the real money into the project, we wanna check in with the client group, the project steering team, run the gauntlet in a gate review meeting, read out the design, make sure that they're okay with what we're doing, how we've modulized the content, uh, which may or may not facilitate, you know, people being able to skip things. Um, you know, and, and as clients who have any experience with a training organization in their pasts, they probably realized or probably had experience themselves that sometimes they were trained on things that they already knew and perhaps thought of it as a waste of time. So I try to address that and how I might modulize uh, some of the content. Um, but we review that design and then that feeds the fourth phase, the development phase. I, my tendency is to assign a lead developer so that when push comes to shove and there's arguments about how we should do things somebody's got to make the decision otherwise that stuff drags on forever so i have a king or queen of the developers and they get to decide okay i hear you i hear you i hear you this is the decision move on um time's a waste them uh we're, we're wasting shareholder equity when we uh, get caught up in uh, issues that maybe are quite arbitrary and somebody needs to flip a coin make the decision and then everybody move on um, so the, in the developer, the developers then working with the lead developer, sometimes it's the lead developer and that's the only person doing the development, they're going to work with other master performers, other subject matter experts as necessary to develop the content. And per the design, now the design had three levels, it had an event map of lessons, it had a lesson map of instructional activities, and then there was a specification sheet for each instructional activity. Three types of instructional activities, uh, information, demonstration, and application exercises for practice and feedback. I call them infos, demos, and appos. And that's the information, demonstration, applications are what gets developed per their specifications uh, using the sources that were called out in the specification. This is all comes out of the design, so you give a fairly clear roadmap to developers on what they're going to develop. Now, however, once they're in the development phase, developers get to do micro-design. They're going to take the information and they're going to design how we're going to present it, what graphics we might use to reinforce the content, uh, how we're going to do the demonstration. Is it going to be a regular speed demonstration? Are we going to do a regular speed and then go do a slow-mo demo? Because the hand is quicker than the eye. And sometimes we need to slow down things so that people can really see the nuances of what it is we're trying to demonstrate. And when I'm demonstrating things, I'm demonstrating the terminal performance, authentic, just like back on the job as best that we can do it. Um, sometimes it's not necessary to include all the rich details that come in the job environment because uh, that causes cognitive overload. So sometimes you're trying to do you know, simple demonstration of things, line art, not pictures. Um, to simplify things so that people can grasp it, absorb it. And what we're doing with the demonstration also is it should forecast for the learners, the participants in training, what they're going to do in the APO, the application exercise, the practice with feedback. So when, I, when we design this stuff, we designed it backwards. We said, here's the APO. This is what they got to be able to do when they get to the job. Here's our best you know, simulation of that. Let's do a demonstration, yes or no. Sometimes it's not necessary, but let's do a demonstration sometimes of that to help them get a grasp on what it actually is they're going to be expected to do. And then before the demonstration, we're going to give them all this information that comes out of the analysis data. So that's what the developers in the development phase are going to create the content. Now, we expect them to do various levels of testing in the development phase. What we, what sometimes is called alpha testing and beta testing. Uh, it was also called at different times developmental testing and alpha testing. So there's a whole bunch of different language for this. But the first test for me is you give it to your neighbor, the person in the cube, a friend of yours in the business, somebody who's not necessarily a master performer, but can look at it and say, hey, you got some misspellings here. Your grammar is you know, poor. Your uh, punctuation is uh, leaves a little bit to be desired. Um, this sentence doesn't make any sense at all. You need to clean that up, that kind of stuff, surface level kinds of stuff. 
because you don't want to waste time with the master performers in your next test, what I would nowadays call the beta test, um, where master performers are going to look at this stuff and they're going to have to put their eyes to this and say, you know, is this accurate? Is it complete? Is it appropriate content? And so we're doing all of that and then tuning it up and when I do my projects, I give my developers three passes at the content. They're creating the, the version, the first version for the alpha test. Then they're going to update it to create the beta version for the beta test. And then they can create the third version, which then allows us to segue into the next phase in my model, pilot testing. So when we do, and, and we don't review any of this with the project steering team in a gate review meeting. Um, I hate those kinds of reviews where somebody is turning the page and you know feeling like they got to give feedback so let me give you some when it's not necessary um, I want the that review uh, the de that developmental review if you will um, to be done in a pilot test session where I'm going to simulate if you will the very first delivery in fact it is the very first delivery and we're gonna call it a pilot test session now, I've had clients who've said, you know, I, I hate pilot test guy. Uh, they're just an excuse to have poor content and poor product and have a failure. And you go, oh, it's just a pilot. So I started telling them that, well, wait a minute. Mine are full destructive tests here. I'm going to try to break this content, this training, to see what really doesn't work. Because we want to find that out before we do a general release and let the, you know, let the audiences or audience you know, either pull it or we push it out to them, how, whatever's, you know, deemed, uh, you know, business smart. Um, and so I, I'm going to do this pilot test and uh, uh, I need two types of audiences when I do my pilot test. I need the actual target audience so I can put them through the pilot test and measure their learning at the end of it. Now, of course, that doesn't indicate whether or not it's going to transfer back out to the job and that's another part of the evaluation that we're going to have to do but but in the pilot test when we conduct a pilot test whether it's instructor-led training or self-paced training or coached training um, or instruction um, we want to know you know did people get it what we were trying to convey what we wanted them to learn did they learn it in the training environment so to speak and uh, but they can't tell us the target audience can't tell us whether what they learned was accurate complete or appropriate so the other half of the audience that I want in my pilot tests are master performers other subject matter experts if necessary um, so that I can put them through the training and they can tell me whether or not I got it accurate enough complete enough and whether it was appropriate or not. The learners, the target audience, can't tell me that. And if I've just put master performers through the training, I can't measure learning from their, you know, pre-capabilities, knowledge and skills to their terminal at post-training knowledge and skills. And so I need those two audiences. Now when I explain that to my clients, the project steering team, they get it. And I tell them that unlike, you know, maybe other projects they've been involved in, we're not coming after the development phase. I'm going to show it to you guys. We're going to go to the pilot test, which is really in many models part of the development phase. But I've called it out separately because I want to make a big deal about it because I really want to do this as best as can be done in the client situation and really prove in or prove out, do a full destructive test break it if possible and clients like that my immediate client is maybe a little bit wary about that but the project steering team the other stakeholders you know that's what they want they want this tested before you you know put their people through it um, and so that's what I do and so at the end of the pilot test we're doing debriefings throughout the pilot session where you know we want to ask people about things before too much time has gone by and they forget about it because they're into the next set of details so every lesson or two or three depends um, we'll do debriefings of the pilot test participants and we'll segregate the data, the feedback that comes from the target audience representatives and then from the master performer representatives um, so that we understand, you know, what these two groups, how they think about it, what's their reaction to this. Um, and anyway, so then we will, we will, at the end of this pilot test, we will do a final debriefing. 
and it's always quite extensive. It usually adds a bunch of time to whatever you're going to do. If it was a two-day course that you'd built, maybe it takes three days to deploy this to deliver it in the pilot test session um, because of all the debriefings that we have strewn throughout the whole thing. But then we create a pilot, based on the data, we create a pilot test report and it includes our revision recommendations. Then we go to the project steering team's gate review meeting, run that gauntlet, review all the feedback that we've gotten, uh, all the hard data, all the soft data, the objective data, the subjective data, and we say, here's our revision recommendations. Now, sometimes the recommendation is, the audiences are saying this, but we disagree. So we're recommending that we don't respond to their recommendations to make things, to make the changes that they may have suggested, and, we, and here's our reasons. And we lay that in front of the project steering team and they get to decide. Now, there have been times when the, when the pilot sessions, audiences have said, this is too tough, um, you know, and this is not exactly how we're, we're doing this work right now. And I take that to the project steering team and say, well, this is the future state you wanted me to train on. This is what you want people to learn. So, of course, it doesn't reflect what they're doing right now. This is the new state, the future state, the soon-to-be state. And I've had clients go, okay, ignore the feedback and go ahead and keep it as it is. And other times, you know, most of the time, actually, um, we're taking the feedback and we're saying, okay, the target audience said this, the master performer said the same thing. So our revision recommendation is that, yeah, we make those changes. And we want the project steering team to approve or question or challenge that and to agree or disagree and then we're going to go forward doing what it is that they want us to do not just the feedback that comes from the target audience uh, or the master performers involved in a pilot test so we do the pilot test and and at the mean at the end of the gate review meeting you know whatever wherever that dust is settled on all those revision recommendations those turn into revision specifications and that's used to feed the final phase, revision and release. And in revision and release, the same developers are involved, as, involved in the uh, development phase, and they tweak, update, blow it up, start all over again. And the big decision that's gotta be decided back in the pilot test gate review meeting is, when we make these changes, are we gonna need to pilot test this again? I mean, yes or no is the answer, and the, the client gets to, and stakeholder gets to decide whether or not, no, we don't need to pilot test again, let's just, you know, take it to market. And, or they decide that, yeah, let's just take it to market and let's do very tight, controlled evaluation of this to see if there's further tweaking that needs to happen. Because maybe we're in a hurry to get this out there, and, you know, something that's not perfect is better than nothing at all, so let's go ahead and do that. Or, you know, it's a mistake to put something out there that's not quite perfect. So, yeah, let's pilot test that again. The second delivery then, if you will, will be a second pilot test. We'll do a similar level of uh, debriefings um, and evaluations as we're delivering this. But maybe we're only focused on less things now. The things that were, you know, questionable that came out of the uh, first pilot session and the revision recommendations that became revision specifications. So once the updates are made in that final phase, we release it. We release it into the systems within the organization that allow for content to be pushed out to people. Maybe we're going to schedule the classes or make the e-learning available and we're going to put it on people's individual training and development plans or suggest to management that they sign their people up for things or re require them to participate and complete this training in a certain time frame or whatever or we put it in some sort of a repository where people can pull the content and sometimes we do both um, so th this whole model that is addy like mcd with the six phases um, sometimes that's done after a curriculum architecture design project is done and the curriculum architecture design gives you a jump start on the analysis and the design. But, of, but oftentimes you're, you're doing development of content, instructional content, without a curriculum architecture on the front end. And so you have to be able to you know, go deep with your initial analysis and your design if you didn't have a curriculum architecture. 
But if you did have one, then you've got to be able to take that analysis data and leverage that and not go and reinvent it and redo it as if it never existed. So uh, that shortens projects when you have a curriculum architecture on the front end. Uh, the boundaries for your content are better established and you understand that there's other modular content out there and maybe some of the content that could go into the course that you're developing or the resource that you're developing, maybe that's covered elsewhere before or after the event that you're creating. So I began using, when I went from just pure modular content, calling everything a module, to three levels of design, the training and development event, which is composed of training and development lessons, which themselves are composed of training and development instructional activities, info, demo, apo. Sometimes you're combining the various phases, whether or not you had a curriculum architecture, but sometimes you're gonna conduct some analysis and that's gonna to lead to a couple of different work streams. And, and this is often happens when your project, your, your analysis data suggests that there's other things that need to be addressed in the environment, the information and data. Now, whether you consider performance support, job aids, guidance, those kinds of things to be information and data out there in the workplace, it's not training, it's not, it is instructional. So, but you can have breakout in a couple work streams. You can have some group creating new policies and procedures um, and new job aids that reflect that. While you're gonna create the hands-on training to give people plenty of practice with feedback to really hone their skills, help them memorize what it is they need to do until they get out on the job and start doing it every day and begin to memorize their tasks and their responses in that manner, because the learning always continues post-training, if you will. Um, but so there's different kinds of configurations for this. But let me back up now and, and, and go back through. So the various outputs of this are key and critical. Phase one, you have a project plan. And you also probably have interview notes and from your talking with the client, various other stakeholders. So you have a lot of data that you can capture and use to feed into the rest of the process. In the analysis phase, there's those four types of analysis data. The target audience, the performance requirements, which in my model includes a gap analysis. So what's ideal performance look like and what are the gaps? And then what are the enabling knowledge and skills? You know, what do you gotta know to be able to do? What are the knowledge and skills that enable performance? Um, and then we also wanna take a look at, you know, what existing content that shareholder equity is previously been invested in creating or buying content and can we, should we reuse some of that? Either reuse it as is or after modification. That then again leads to the design phase where there is the training and development event map and specifications. Uh, so there's a visual thing about the event, what it looks like, and then there's a, a sheet, if you will, a specification sheet on each uh, event because maybe you're designing multiple events. You've got a modular approach, if you will, because maybe there's a couple events that people can take or not take depending on whether they know it or they, are, or they don't know it. So some people with their incoming knowledge and skills know things and we don't want to confront them. So maybe what could have been perceived as a, you know, one training course is actually three two modules on the front end that maybe some people are gonna take and others aren't gonna take, and then they're maybe all gonna to go to the third event, the main event, if you will, um, and take that training. Um, so that, that configuration comes out. So there's a event map or event maps. There's lesson maps, uh, although an event could be just one lesson. Most of the time it's multiple lessons. And each lesson is gonna have one or more instructional activity, infos demos and appos um, and then that leads us to creating a uh, so then we can create the actual content and in a traditional instructor-led training we would have a participant guide we'd have the instructor guide there might be an administrative guide because maybe we need to give directions to the people who run the facilities and how to set the room up you know how many projectors do we need how many screens do we need do how many breakout rooms do we need um, 
you know, what, it, what is everything that it takes to actually deliver this? And uh, so the instructor may be responsible for setting up the classrooms and scheduling them and doing all those kinds of things, or there's an administrative group. So those are the three key outputs, if you will, from the development phase. And we're going to pilot test that as well. The administrative guy that says, here's how to set up the room, you know, either that's sufficiently conveyed to people how to do it, what to do, what it should look like, or it didn't. And so that is also subject to being updated post-pilot. There's the pilot report, um, the pilot test report with the revision uh, recommendations, and then we come out of all of that with a set of tight, hopefully, revision specifications, and that feeds the final phase, in which case you're updating that participant guide, that instructor guide, um, and the administrative guide. And then you release that into the system so that the organization that's responsible for enabling access or responsible for deploying, delivering this, this training, uh, they can do their thing. And then ongoing evaluation happens, you know, depending on what the organization has put in place for doing that for all or some or a few of their courses. Um, what I'd always recommend to my clients is that, you know, after the first few deliveries on something that's really of critical importance to the organization, that they keep a closer eye on those initial deliveries until they are all assured that everything is just fine. And then, of course, their next concern should be on changes in the workplace that should be reflected in changes, maintenance, updates to the training content. Um, so the, uh, the, the kinds of content that can be produced in all of this, I, I use basically three buckets to keep things in. Now there's a fourth bucket nowadays. Uh, but the first is group paste. And group paste is important, critical for some things because uh, oftentimes it's easier to do interpersonal communications training, practice and feedback in a group paste training session or in a learning session or instructional session. But uh, we oftentimes need the instructor or facilitators of that to observe the performance of the students, the trainees, the learners and give them feedback, corrective feedback, reinforcing feedback, whatever's necessary. Yeah, guy, continue doing that, but change this other part here. And let's try it again. So what's really critical, of course, is that, you know, one shot practice and feedback often isn't sufficient, and we need to allow people to, to practice and get feedback and practice again and get feedback and practice again and get feedback to build their confidence, to build their skills, to build their ability to transfer this back out into the job and then deal with things that don't go so smoothly at first, but continue applying what they've learned and not dropping it in favor of how their past practices. So that's group pace training. It's scheduled, which makes it problematic for you know the management and the target audience and the target audience to get what they need when they need it because it's a scheduled event and that's inconvenient. So back in 1981 at Motorola I was encouraged by Bill Wiggenhorn, all of us were, to move as much content from group paste into self paste. So you know we create little booklets that people could read or nowadays we create videos and audio podcasts and things like that that people can go get when they want. It's available on demand or anytime. And so anytime they can get what they need, and that's self-paced. Um, sometimes we want something that's kind of a, a hybrid in between the two. So we might have coached as a deployment means, as a delivery means, which is also something that we have to schedule usually, unless we've got you know a, an army of coaches we can call on demand and anytime we can get access to them and they can give us the guidance that they need. Um, but, but most often it's something that you kind of have to schedule. And maybe it's a shorter term thing and you can call the, the coach and find out they're not available today, but they can talk to you tomorrow morning and that's a whole lot better than waiting for some course that's scheduled that may not happen again for another month or two or three or four. Um, and so this is kind of a quicker response. Uh, it's just not as scalable as group paced instruction where we can maybe train 10, 12, 20 people at a time and with a coach maybe we can do one person, maybe a handful of people, but the larger that that gets it the more it looks like a uh, instructor led group paced kind of training session rather than coached. So we can uh, do the coach thing and we can provide the coach and the learner, the participant, with 
guidance we can give the coach, and I call that kind of uh, training structured OJT, structured on-the-job training. Um, and a supervisor can be my coach. One of my peers working with me in the same department, doing the same kind of work, they could be my coach. So it could be that any coach will do. But sometimes we need a certified coach. We need somebody who's been certified in the problem-solving methodology and uh, we trust them or maybe it's part of a regulatory requirement. It could be many reasons on this. High-stakes stuff, though, needs to be in tighter control. And perhaps we want to make sure that people who are doing the coaching know what the heck they're doing and we just don't have any coach. So there's sometimes any old coach will do and other times when we need a certified coach. There's a bunch of different kinds of media and the media is what's been changing over the decades. I've been doing this kind of stuff since 1979 and about the only thing that's changed is the technology that helps us capture content um, and deliver content. Um, and we need to take advantage of that. And uh, But I think the group-paced, self-paced, and coach modes work real well. Now the fourth bucket is informal learning. This is what I've been calling since uh, the early 80s, 1982, when I became a consultant and I was doing curriculum architecture work and the clients would prioritize the gaps from the ideal set of content that they had to what they actually had. So all those gaps got prioritized, you know, high, medium, low, or zero. And zero was the signal that I allowed my clients to use to signal me and everybody else from here on after that that has no value. We shouldn't spend any money developing that content. We're going to mark it with a zero, not just low, but a zero. And therefore, we're going to leave that to unstructured, on-the-job training. They're going to learn it by hook or by crook, trial and error. And 20-some years later, we started calling that informal learning, which is okay. But, but so th that approach is that we, in training, or instruction or in learning don't need to address each and everything that possibly can be uncovered through analysis um, or respond to every single request that a client has because sometimes it's not worth it to the organization. The return on that investment is negative or nil and there may be bigger fish to fry and that's what we should be attending to. High stakes performance, high risk, high reward not low risk, low reward, low stakes, the low hanging fruit, so to speak. Um, so we, this is a, you know, we can, we can uh, salute our client when they come to us with a request and go off and do analysis and let the data chips, the analysis data chips fall where they may and let the client organization decide, is this worthy or not? That's a business decision. It is not an instructional design decision or an instructional systems designer decision as to what content to bring to the target audience and in what manner, what mode and media. Those are business decisions. And while you might be able to do something through a video, maybe doing hand shadow puppets on the wall could be just as effective uh, with the proper audio track or script that's given to the instructor. But not everything warrants these steep investments, especially if the content is going to be somewhat volatile. Why put volatile content in a video that's going to be very expensive and time consuming to keep up to date? Um, so one of the things that you always need to be looking at is, you know, so this content, these various knowledge and skills that people need to learn, how volatile is that? Is it fairly stable? Um, and that should help inform the design and delivery uh, decisions. Um, so we've talked about the uh, first phase and the initial request with the uh, that comes to the training organization. You go back to the requester and you, you can ask them a bunch of questions. Now, I have an interview guide that, that I published back in the early 90s to help my staff do this kind of work. So as a kind of a controlling person, um, I wanted to make sure that they didn't conduct interviews with the requester and other key stakeholders and then come back with only part of the story. And I aligned my uh, interview guide to my format and the flow of my project plan. So if those were all tightly aligned and if you got 
all the information you needed following my interview guide, then you had exactly what you needed to create the project plan. Um, I saw too often people go off and do that kind of stuff and then get ready to write the project plan and realize they didn't have what they needed and sometimes they'd make it up. And I never really liked that at all. So you're doing all of that to get ready then, in my model, to go and meet with the project steering team, the client and other key stakeholders um, who are going to participate in you uh, with in this effort with you because they have a stake in the uh, what you're doing and they have a stake in the terminal performance back out on the job and if training is a means to that ends improving that uh, stabilizing that whatever their issues are um, that cause the request uh, we want their them to be involved in this. We want them to own the project. We want them to own the project plan. We want them to own the analysis data, the design data, everything, um, because we're working for them. And if they're going to want to stay arm's length from us, then, then that suggests that there's other issues here that we need to be wary of. When we go into phase two with the analysis again, um, I like to use a facilitated group process to conduct the analysis team meeting. Therefore, back in phase one at the gate review meeting, I've said, okay, this is the project plan. Now you need to hand pick the master performers I'm gonna meet with. And are there other deeper subject matter experts that we may need to call upon that aren't doing the job to a level of mastery, but know a lot about some aspect of the job or some future state aspect of the job, something that's coming down the pike and is gonna hit the real world soon. Um, and that we need to you know, build something for that near-term future um, and not just for today. Um, so either that uh, is necessary or not. And if I can't get a, uh, assemble a group of usually eight to 12 people the, and, and form an analysis team with these master performers and subject, other subject matter experts and sometimes managers and supervisors of the target audience and sometimes novice performers because we want their voice in this as well, Perhaps the master performers have been on the job for 20, 25 years, you know, and they don't really know what it's like to climb the learning curve. And we need that voice in to, to represent people who have recently climbed the learning curve and, you know, want to see this thing perhaps be done a little bit differently to deal with that, those issues. If we can't do the facilitated group process, we're going to do a more traditional set of interviews and observations and document reviews and we're going to pull the data out of there and then we're going to go publish our analysis report that will tell us all about the target audience the data that we've captured on them the performance you know what are the outputs and how do we know a good one from bad one what are the key measures what are the tasks who does what what are the various roles and responsibility and task performance and that's ideal performance so what are the gaps why are people struggling? Why isn't everybody a master performer? What are they missing? What, me what outputs and measures do they miss? Are, are they struggling with? What are the probable causes? You know, what are the barriers that they're dealing with that, they're not, that they seem not to be able to avoid? And if it was unavoidable, um, that they don't have strategies and tactics to deal with those barriers. So master performers have those kinds of uh, strategies and tactics on how to avoid things in the first place and what to do if unavoidable, and we wanted to capture all of that. So you can do that again with interviews and observations and document reviews, perhaps. Then we need to understand what are the enabling knowledge and skills. And you're not going to get that usually out of document reviews or observations because there's too many, too much behind, besides the physical behaviors that people exhibit that we can observe. There's the cognitive behaviors, cognitive behaviors that we, you know, what are they thinking? Well, how are they looking at this? Uh, what are they looking at? What kinds of decisions or discriminations are they making? And, uh, you know, because we have to convey that and teach other people how to do the same thing. We want everybody to kind of emulate the master performers, but not just the overt behaviors, but what are the covert behaviors that we need to capture. And then once we've had all that data, we can begin to look at the existing training content, the in, uh, existing information and instruction that exists and see how we might leverage that and use that. You know, it's always best to use the things that are available out there on the job rather than the training organization coming in creating another version of that when it was not necessary. Use the real stuff. Use the vendor manuals if necessary. Incorporate that kind of stuff into your content um, because that's most authentic. 
um, do the analysis report and you take that to the gate review meeting and you know what I like to do is I read it out I answer the questions I answer the challenges I usually read it out at a fairly high level but I've got the detail there and they can the project steering team can see that and somebody might say well where's such and such you know back uh, five years ago this terrible thing happened and you know where how are you attending to that guy and so either I've got it covered or I don't and I needed to be able to allow them to go deep dive into the analysis data to share with them you know that we've we've caught that or we haven't and how we're going to attend that in the design because what I like to do is when I'm done and they've reviewed all of this stuff and I've answered all their questions and challenges etc I like to say okay now this is what I'm gonna do with that in the design phase I look of course unless you stop me right now but I'm gonna take this kind of content and put it in self-paced training I'm gonna modularize that on the front end and people could take what they need what they don't already know to get ready to go to the main event and when they go to the main event this is what I'm going to do in there and I'm going to take this thing here and we're going to tell them about it we're going to show it to them but there's not going to be any practice because it's that simple this other thing here though I'm going to tell them I'm going to show them and I'm going to have them show me back in the application exercises and we're not going to do just one we're going to do one after another after another and then we're going to layer on additional set of knowledge and skills and demonstrate that and then we're going to practice that so sometimes we're conveying teaching a and then letting people practice A. And then we're going to layer on A plus B, a little bit more complicated, maybe an extended thing, and then have them practice A plus B. And then we're going to layer in content C and A, B, C, and have people now practice A and B and C and get practice and feedback on that. Now you have to have rationale reasons for why you're doing that. And clients will often push back and go, well, that's why this thing is so darn long. Um, yeah. So either we just tell them, show them, and let it go at that, but they're not going to be able to transfer that to the job and then do anything. So why are we doing this in the first place if we're not going to actually get people ready to go back to the real world, back to the job, and perform? So either this is worthy high stakes performance and maybe we need people to practice sales skills and asking the uh, questions of the client and logically Socratically leading them to why our product and our features are truly benefits that have true advantages for you over our competitors. You know, just telling people that, you know, as Harold Stolovich and Erica Keep said, you know, telling ain't training. So we got to do more than tell them. We got to tell them show them demonstration and then application exercises and to me that always means more than one apo where i'm going to start off simply add a little complexity to it and then we might have what guy likes to call the apo from hades the application exercise from hell it's got to be authentic it can't be something that's done every 27 years but it's got to be something that's tough and i'm going to shape people's capability grow their capacity to deal with things that are more and more complex starting off with something fairly simple now and sometimes maybe one practice exercise is sufficient um, so as always it depends and I try to not let instructional designers make those kinds of decisions. If I'm using a facilitated group process, I'm going to have master performers, other subject matter experts, managers, novice performers, etc. making those decisions. How many practice exercises do we need? If this is complex, let's start off with something simple, the A level, then we're going to do A plus B, then A plus B plus C. And how many times do we have them then practice A plus B plus C? Once? Twice? Three times? You know, what is what is necessary to people's capability to really learn and master this to go back out into the real world and deal with something that's complex, hairy, from Hades, from hell, however you want to label it, and be able to do it. Those are business decisions that lead to instructional design decisions. And if I've got a team of master performers and other subject matter experts, etc., handpicked by my project steering team, I'm going to let them drive that. I don't have to ask, you know, how frequently is this done? How difficult is it to do? Those kinds of analysis sets of data I don't collect because I'm going to make the decision. I'm going to inform the design decisions differently in the moment with master performers telling me what to do. 
and if there's arguments and debates about that on the design team you know the analysis team becomes the design team or a subset of the analysis team becomes the design team I tell my clients I don't want anybody new with their voice in the mix here you should have had them in the analysis team in the first place and of course I tell them this in phase one in that gate review meeting that you pick the analysis team a subset or the whole darn group is going to become the design team and they're going to look over the shoulder if you will of the instructional designer the instructional designer is going to have to design out loud well I'm going to do this for that reason does that make sense everybody agree that the guy's got some logic here in doing that and then I'm going to do this other thing and does everybody agree with that no you don't agree you do agree talk about it let's make a decision as a group okay we're going to go with whatever one person said or something in between but so a facilitated group process is a different way of doing design now it's design thinking agile are also to different names for this bringing a group of people together who have empathy for the learner I want empathy first for the uh, shareholder whose equity we're converting into instruction I want empathy for the uh, managers and supervisors the leaders of the individual contributors that we may be training and I want empathy for the performers as well they were the ones who have to actually do the work but I need to do that with consistent with understanding the requirements of all the stakeholders involved and not just from the learner. So when I see in de you know, design thinking have empathy for the learner, that's just a partial view. Um, it's not complete enough for me and my past practices, things that I've been writing about since the early 80s about all of this. Um, and so I think that you know design thinking that's fine you know call the way some of us did this work back in the day by some new terms um, because in truth most of the world of instructional design instructional systems design uh, haven't been uh, practicing uh, the best practices good practices proven practices uh, they're just cranking out content uh, doing development without design without analysis without any plan to guide that um, as if cranking out content was the objective it's not it's not about learning it's all about performance um, again when I go into the development phase then uh, with the after having done the design after having specified you know here's the event or events here's the lessons within those here's the instructional activity you know some activities uh, lessons could be simply information leading to the next lesson which could be more information and a demonstration and application you know it varies all over the map and there's just not one right way to do that not every lesson starts off with information sometimes the lesson could start off with uh, application exercises I've had clients who told me you know you're gonna be training people who pretty much think that they know this already guy and you know they're not gonna take lightly to this I go okay then the first thing we're gonna do is put them in an authentic exercise uh, I have this concept called the uh, the uh, Apo from hell, Apo from Hades, for those of you who are offended by the word hell, um, this is going to be the worst case thing and we're going to start off the lesson with that. And then I'm going to take these people who think they know what they're doing and let them prove to us that they do or they don't. And prove to themselves that they do or they don't. And then I'm going to be able to tell everybody, okay, so, you know, most of you failed or everybody failed in that first application exercise, but we're going to learn how to do this. So, welcome to the lesson. Here's what we're going to do. You know, here's some information, here's a demonstration, and here's an application exercise. Um, and um, it, sometimes the clients really love that. Now, I don't do that often because that uh, can be distressing to some people. But if I know that the majority of my target audience are not new to the job performers, but incumbent performers who are going to have an attitude coming into this thing here, well then I'll let them prove what they know and what they don't know and what you find in some of those things is that some people do know certain aspects of this and now they can contribute to the learning of others as adult learners um, and they can share their best practices at a nuanced level and apply those and show everybody else how you know follow me and emulate me and, and so there's so that can work really well now in e-learning or video based training or audio podcasts or whatever you're using that's not instructor led whether it's you know face to face in a classroom or virtual webinars or something um, 
you can you know you can help people understand the real world some of them may know it some of them may not they may be too new to the job to actually appreciate you know the real world complexity and difficulties that they're going to face and so sometimes it's helpful to have people in there who are incumbents who can attest to the fact that yeah that's real and this is what i do about it and uh, etc so we can we can capture people's uh, um, contributions in the actual lessons and that can be actually part of a design uh, the, the in design intent is to do that is to leverage the existing knowledge of some of the participants that you would expect to find in a class or a course um, so when we're doing then uh, development post design I think this is critical here that this issue of you know we're not disempowering developers who may be some of the designers or it could be because you know, some people wear all the hats they're the analyst they're the designer they're the developer there's nobody else and so that's easy but if we have a large thing to develop um, maybe we're gonna put two or three or four or five developers on it and we need to divide and conquer to, to accelerate our process and instead of working incrementally on each lesson we're going to divide them up and have people work on the parts they need to understand how it works holistically as a system of instruction at a more you know mid-level micro level as in a course um, but we need to empower the developers you know we may have called out an application exercise here and we have, may have said it's not a case study it's a simulation but we've left it at that and now the developer can create the simulation. Now, if we've been doing a lot of kinds of simulations, we may have some templates, so to speak, that we can use to speed their process in doing that. We don't have to start from, you know, a blank page each and every time. There may be other simulations that we've done, and we're gonna steal some of the instructions for doing it and some of how we frame it and how we present it. So we can leverage off those kinds of things, and that's always good to have, you know, that collection of uh, templates and tools and techniques that uh, that you have been used in the past successfully, and the lessons learned on when that's appropriate and when it's not. But we can allow the developers; they can decide how to create a demonstration, and should it be a video or should it be live in front of the classroom? You know, what's best? Well, how are we deploying this? You know, so there's all sorts of constraints that you put on yourself once you've decided the predominant deployment approach versus what might happen inside. You might have a classroom that's got video in it, okay? So then you can use that kind of thing if the you have the facilities and the wherewithal to develop and deliver that. Um, so, but, so we're not disempowering, we're actually empowering people within a certain set of constraints, the boundaries of the design. Here's the intent. You can see the performance objectives. We've articulated learning objectives, performance uh, terminal objectives, uh, terminal learning objectives, and enabling learning objectives. You know, what are the performance objectives and what are the knowledge and skill objectives is how I've approached that. Um, and then give that to the developers and let them develop. And let them develop uh, the first version for alpha testing with their neighbor, so to speak. Uh, beta testing, the beta test version for beta testing with master performers to take a look at this. Perhaps the people that were on the analysis and design team, they're more than willing, has been my experience, to continue their involvement uh, because they like what they see because this is going to impact performance. This is performance oriented, performance based training. And my experience has been that master performers love that. They want to be involved with something that they perceive is going to be very successful. Um, and so they're willing to take a look at it. Now, I don't often want those people involved in the pilot test session. So we're doing these three levels, three addition, uh, versions, if you will, the pilot version, the beta version, and we're the final version in the development phase is to get ready for with the pilot test version. And then I've arbitrarily carved off that part of the development process, the pilot test, as a separate phase, again, because I want to make a big deal about it, because I want to emphasize that. I wanted to do an acid test. I wanted to get the right people involved and not just who I could, you know, pull together from here and there. I wanted to make sure that the clients had a hand in volunteering the right people, which basically means assigning them, to participate in this pilot test. Um, 
where we're going to do the full destructive test and figure out, you know, what works and what doesn't work and what might we do about it. And that's the stuff we capture in that fifth phase, the pilot test phase. Um, again, I want target audience representatives so I can measure learning. And those people can't tell me whether what I conveyed was accurate, complete, and appropriate. They don't know. And so I need master performers and other subject matter experts to tell me what was accurate, what was complete, and what was appropriate or not. But I can't measure learning with them. So I need the two voices, if you will, to help me understand, will learning occur well enough? And was it the right stuff that they learned? And that's tricky. Um, I don't want the friends of training in my pilot sessions who show up for all of these kinds of things and are happy to help us out as if they have nothing better to do. I want tough people. I want a full destructive test. I want master performers who hate training. You know, I've had plenty of clients say, well, I would give you so-and-so, but you know, they hate you people. I go, sign them up. I, that's exactly who I want. People who aren't going to roll over and play dead and say this was fine when in fact they think it wasn't. I want people who are going to voice their concerns and issues. I mean, how else would you conduct a full destructive test of your content? Um, you know, and then so the pilot test phase can be extended past the delivery of the course, past the delivery of or the participation in self-paced training, past the delivery of a coach session, and extend itself into back at the ranch, back on the job, are people able to actually apply this? And that's always been my desire, but I've received so much pushback on that that uh, we have to wait until we've actually uh, tweaked the content as necessary after the pilot session, released it for, you know, uh, deploying it or allowing people to access it, and then doing evaluation out there in the real world as people are trying to put this in place. There's many different ways to do that. If this is high stakes performance, we want to do a more rigorous job of evaluation after this is out in the field. Uh, if it's really, really high stakes, I usually can convince the client to actually, that's part of the pilot session. Let's tweak it after the pilot training has been delivered or, or self-paced, uh, been participated in. Um, but let's not end the pilot session. Let's extend it out there into people transferring it to the job, learning it, uh, you know, and see whether or not this is working. Um, before we make it and do that in a controlled manner so we don't let all the whole world go sign up and take this stuff when we're not really sure it's ready for prime time. So if this is truly high stakes, I mean, if life and death is at risk here, we'll probably extend the pilot session post the initial delivery and continue the evaluation as to whether or not the pilot participants, the, the target audience representatives anyway, can go back out into the world and apply this out there in their performance context and see if this is successful before we're ready to make the final updates, revisions, and then release it for ongoing deployment, ongoing access. Um, again, if, uh, you know, if you're assigned to do kind of me medium stakes, low stakes kinds of performance and you're developing content for that, uh, my approach here is simply overkill in the extreme, and I wouldn't recommend it. You're going to find a need to find a way to shortcut all of this. Uh, before we get near the wrap up here, I want to talk about combining phases. So, if we had done a curriculum architecture design prior to doing this MCD level of uh, uh, development effort, design effort, analysis, you know, the ADI level, um, I would do a uh, I'm, if I had a curriculum architecture here, I can combine my analysis and design phases and I have graphics that show that because oftentimes we have enough good analysis that we can continue the detailing of our analysis data and segue right into design without checking in with the project steering team in a gate review meeting, um, but do the analysis and design in a group forum using my facilitated group process methodologies, um, and then go into development, and then go into pilot test, and then do the revision release. 
Uh, there's other times when the data that we have coming out of a curriculum architecture is so good that we can go from project planning and kickoff right into development. And there's times when we can go from project planning and kickoff to do development. Say we're developing a bunch of uh, training modules, modular training on policies and procedures. And if we've already proven in our approach to that and the two templates that we use and how we instruct people, um, maybe we can just jump into development. Uh, because we have a model that's proven successful here and we don't need to go back and do more analysis and more design we can just do the development and then pilot test it or not if we've really got a proven process we can create content you know after project planning that says okay let's go create the next 20 modules here uh, modular sets of content and create them and then simply release them and if we have a good evaluation system in place, we'll get a signal back from the user communities, the, the performers out there, as to whether or not this is working for them or not. So there are times in place where you can shortcut all these steps here, but those are business decisions to shortcut steps. Those are not instructional design decisions or instructional systems design decisions. Oh no, those are business decisions because the business lives with the consequences of what we produce. Um, there's much more on all of this in my Lean ISD book that I published in 1999, and as well as an update into the fourth book in my six pack, which is uh, comes from 2011, where I took a bunch of books and I reconfigured them and updated them, refreshed them, if you will. And that book is uh, Modular Curriculum Development and Acquisition. So for uh, for somebody who wants to go into the deeper examples of all of these things and what does a uh, more examples of an event spec or such, you can look in uh, those two sources. So this has been another edition of my adventures in performance-based training and development with your host, me, Guy Wallace. And as I've said earlier, this, is, this series is also known as the Insomnia Solution, but not for my insomnia, but for yours. I was just kidding about that. Cheers.